So we've been in this series called The Kingdom, learning about the kingdom and studying the kingdom. And, and I'm excited about this because here's what I fully believe, and hopefully you believe in the same. I believe that if we all get this, we're going to grow tremendously this year. I want, you to, I want you to open up your mind's eye for a second. And so imagine if we all grew. What, what would it sound like? What would it sound like if everyone's worship was passionate? Come on, get there with me. Even see it in your eyes. What would it look like? What, what, would, it, what would it sound like if, 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 if we all got together in unity? How would it feel if the church moved in strength? If everyone was growing together? I believe the kingdom, the teaching of the kingdom, is what's going to get us there. It's not going to be some motivational speech by Pastor Mike. It's not going to be some awesome dynamic worship. It's going to be the very thing that Jesus continued to teach throughout his ministry. 126 times, he mentioned something called the kingdom. And that means, simply, it's not about territory. It's not about property. It's about what would it look like if God had full reign in our lives? And so we've been talking about this. We've been talking about, like, what would it mean for the kingdom of God to be actually our reality? Not the reality that we see on CNN or Fox News or NBC or ABC. It's the reality of Scripture living and being active in our lives. What would it look like? It should be our reality. And then last week we talked about that. The kingdom of God is not natural. It goes against every every instinct that we have. Jesus said, if you want to be exalted, you must first humble yourself. The way up is down, the way in is out, that is the kingdom of God. And so for the rest of the series, I want to talk about what Jesus talked about and and all of his analogies, because he would always start off saying, the kingdom of God is like, the kingdom of God is like, the kingdom of God is like. And so today, I'm just going to let Jesus preach. I'm going to literally like, this is, this is not good integrity. I'm going to steal Jesus' sermon. Is that Okay. I'm going to steal his sermon and let him preach. And we're going to have some dialogue in regards to this. And so we're just going to live. If you do have your Bibles, we're going to live in Matthew 13. And um, if you want the copy and paste my notes, they're, they're on our church center app right on the homepage. If you scroll down to the bottom. Um, but let's read this together. And I might stop here and there. So thank God I'm not making you stand during the reading of the word. Who's grateful today? I should make you stand because you need to pre-burn those cupcakes. Hallelujah. All right. So verse 1, it says, the same day Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea. Oh, man, I could just preach on that one statement all day. Some of us need to get out of the house. Some of you need to get out of the house and actually do something for God. We've gotten real comfortable, but even, we even see the example of Jesus getting out of the house and doing some damage for the kingdom of God. So he got out of the house and great crowds gathered around him so that he got into the boat and sat down. He made a platform, and the whole crowd stood on the beach, and he told them many things in parables. My, my Jesus, my Savior, was a great storyteller. And he said this, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up. Since they had no depth of soil, when the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on the good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He, and then he says, as he who has ears, let them hear. Then the disciples came to him and says, yo, bro, what are you talking about? We are fishermen, and you're over here talking about agricultural stuff. So they said, you got to break it down to us. And the disciples said, what, what, what do you mean? What are you speaking in these parables? And then he answered them. He says this, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. But to them it has not been given. For to the one who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance from the one who has not, even when he has, he was, he would, what will be taken away. So he's telling them this. He's saying this, basically. Hey. I'm giving people these things in parables because, like, when I spoon feed it, people don't appreciate it. Sometimes, like, it's worth something to you if you invest in it. So Jesus is saying, I want you to invest in this teaching. That's what I want you to do. So that's why I'm preaching it, because the kingdom of God needs your participation. 
And so many of us, what we do is we're used to church as a spectator sport, not a participatory sport. We come and we listen to these guys preach. You come and you listen to this bald man sweat a little bit and yell at you. And then you go home and you kind of feel a little better about yourself. But that is not the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is about you getting into it and being invested into it. And so he, he, did, he did his disciples a solid. He goes, all right, let me, let me break it down to you. I'm going to give you this one. Let me explain to you what this parable means. So he says, here then, here's the parable of the sword. This is what I mean. He goes, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom, that's you, look to the person, push the person next to you and say, that's you. It should have gotten a little more violent in here. All right? That's you. So if you hear the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away that has what's been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. As for what was sown on the rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word, immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no root in himself. Can I challenge this? I think, and I'm, I'm putting myself in the same category because I, I attend church with you. There are times where we do receive the word and we receive it with joy, right? Oh, pastor, that was a good word. And you receive it with joy, but then you walk away, Monday morning hits, Monday morning hits, and we forget about it. Maybe most of us are in this category. And then he said this, receives the joy and yet has no root in itself, but endures for a while, but when tribulation or persecution arises on the account of the word, immediately he falls away. As for what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and it proves unfaithful. That's the what is sown in, on the good soil. Everybody say good soil. One more time, good soil. This is the one, this is the one who hears the word, understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields. In one case, a hundredfold, in another 60, in another 30. And then he puts this other parable. And he says, he puts another parable for me. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like, or maybe compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, hmm, while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the church is sleeping is when we're most vulnerable to the attacks of the enemy. When the church is sleeping, that's when we are most vulnerable to the attacks of the enemy. And notice that the crazy part, he said the enemy came and then it just went away. All the enemy has to do is just whisper one lie into the church while it's sleeping, and then we handle the rest. Some of us want to blame the devil on anything, but sometimes it's just us continuing to perpetuate the lies within the church because we sleep in. Am I preaching already? And so he went away. So when the plants came up and bore again, the weeds also appeared. And the servant of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, do you, do you, did you not sow good seed in your field? I love this because the master is obviously God in this. And it's funny when bad things happen, who are we quick to blame? God. Master, did you not, grow, did you not sow in good seed what they said? He said, how then do we have weeds? And then he said to them, an enemy has done this. So the servant said to them, then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, no. This is fascinating. He said, no, lest in gathering the weeds, you root up the wheat along with them. He says, let both grow together. Oh. Let both grow together. Remember, this is, this is a parable, this is an analogy, this is a metaphor that he's creating with, with his disciples, and, and, and later on we figure out that the wheat are, are those that are child of God, children of God, and then, and then the weeds are the, those who are going to reject God or walk away from God. But, but notice that he says, let them grow together. Aren't there times in life where both bad people and good people are prospering? Aren't there times in life, like, you kind of could, could go back to this parable and, and answer the question, why do good things happen to bad people? Why do bad things happen to good people? It's because sometimes God just lets them grow together. Because eventually it's all going to get sorted out. And in fact, that's what he says. Then, then he said, let them grow together until the harvest. 
And at the harvest time, I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, and yet, and, but gather the wheat into my barns. So the wheat are going to go into the barns, and then the weeds are going to get burned. All right? You're going to fire up some weed, and not the good kind. I'm talking about the bad kind. And please do not use this scriptural reference to justify your drug consumption, okay? But here he's talking about that, that he, some are going to stay and some aren't going to, some aren't going to survive the fires of life. So he tells them that this is what the kingdom of God is like. But very quickly, right before he told that parable, he gave us a little bit of an inventory in regards to Christians. And again, my passion, my desires for all of us to grow together. And so when he talked about the seed, scattering the seed, he gave us some categories. And I want us to take inventory, and you need to do the work. This is not about me watching me just spit up here. This is about you doing the work. So I want you to take inventory. Which one of these are you? Here's the first one, Christian. The first one is, are you a checkbox Christian? Are you a checkbox Christian? And what I mean by that is, Check, I did my Sunday. And some of us, it hurt really bad during the pandemic when you couldn't check your box. Right? And, and, and notice that he says that they still don't get it even though they're on the path. He, they're, you're on the path. of You have the availability to grow. You have the access to grow. You have the same access that the person next to you who's growing in Jesus. You have the same access. You're on the path, but you're still not getting it. Why? Because we allow the evil one to snatch it away. Because we're the checkbox Christians. We, we come here, but what's the point of coming if you're not growing? Are we a checkbox Christian? What's the point of coming if we're not growing? I, I don't get a bonus check for butts and seats. I have no interest in just having butts and seats. We, you might have heard in the story, we, we started our church in a, in a UFC boxing gym, right? And, and I love it. I, I used to joke around and be like, I wish somebody would pick a fight with me at our church. I wish you would. I have champion. I don't know if you saw it. Zab Judah for a while attended our church, right? Boxing and UFC fighters. I wish you would. And don't get it twisted. Your pastor could hold his own too, though. It wasn't just them. I actually sparred with some of them, all right? And so, so I, I could draw a crowd by just asking those guys to show up. I could draw a crowd by just, you know, starting a fight. You ever seen a fight and how quickly? Remember in high school, you saw a fight, everyone just ran? Also, someone to fight, ooh. It's not hard to draw a crowd. I could care less about a crowd. I don't want to draw a crowd. I want you to draw near to Jesus. And so ask ourselves, are you just a check spot? And no condemnation. No condemnation because I've had seasons where I was just, I had the seasons where I had this arrogance, especially when I was working at another church. I'm like, you're lucky I'm here kind of attitude. You're lucky I showed up today kind of attitude. Are you a checkbox Christian? Or here's the second one. Are you a casual Christian? Remember, this is a joy. They received the word with joy. And then when things got rocky, deuces, I'm out. Are you a casual Christian? It's only you're a Christian when things are doing well. But when, what happens when mom has cancer? What happens when you get fired? What happens when the, you, your marriage ain't going the way you planned? What happens when your life ain't going, your career ain't going the way you planned? Do, do, you, do you abandon your faith because you're all about convenience when it comes to your faith? And that's what he's talking about. He's like, they received it with joy. I got the goosebumps. Let there be like, ooh, good job. You got the goosebumps. You felt good. But when things get rocky, when things get rocky, you abandon ship. It's too hard. And I watched it happen during the pandemic. It's too rocky politically. Pa pastor's not supporting my side of the aisle politically. Or, or we're, you know, I can't believe they shut down. Or I'm anti-vax. I'm pro-vax. And it's just too hard to maintain unity. I'm out. And because consumerism has infected our churches, what we do is we just go and we find a church that fits all of our preferences Right? 
serves me in every area in my life. And I'm not saying that you're wrong, but I am asking you the question, are you just a casual Christian? Because if it's not family, it's not kingdom. Write that down. And you don't abandon your family when things aren't convenient. Come on. I'm in that stage right now where our boys, I'm just their Uber driver. Anybody ever been there? This is the most inconvenient time. And not only that, they're developing their planning skills and they suck at it. And they think they're good. Hey, dad, can you take me here at this time? Okay, cool. He's got it organized. Two minutes before we're about to leave. Oh, yeah, can you pick up Jeff and Jayla and Cam and all those other people? Two minutes before I leave, I already planned my route, and I got to go and do other things. This world ain't about you, Chase. <laughs> Sorry, I blacked out for a second. <laughs> Coming back. Whew. You all right? I'm all right. <laughs> but I don't abandon my family when it becomes inconvenient. And I think at times we abandon the family of God when it becomes inconvenient. Are you just a casual Christian? And then he talks about the conflicted Christian. And this happened a lot recently in this season. And what I call the conflicted Christian is that's the one that the seed was planted amongst thorns. And the thorns choked their faith. It chokes your faith when the seed of the world comes and questions your beliefs. So a bunch of people out there that are in the season of deconstructing. They say, deconstruct your faith. And you know what? I champion that. I champion that. Because those people now, you're asking the right questions. But don't let the thorns of this world choke your faith. He's still Jesus. He's still on the throne. If you're trying to figure out creationism, go do you, boo-boo. If you're trying to figure out what, what church is supposed to look like, fine. Do you, boo-boo. But still stay close to Jesus. Don't let the thorns of the sea come and choke your faith. Fine, you're a conflicted Christian right now, but don't stay there. And then he talks about the cultivated Christian. And this is the one that, that remember, the seed landed on good soil. And I, like, I use the word cultivated because I love alliteration, obviously. So I needed another C to round up this, these points. But the word cultivated means that you're prepared to be used. And I don't think it's a mistake that he used seeds because if you plant seed in good soil, eventually it'll produce a plant, and then that plant produces fruit. And you know what's in fruit? More seeds. More seeds. Why it's so important. Listen to me. This fits well in our church birthday. Why it's so important for you to grow. It's not just about you. It's about the generations that come after you that need your seed. My Bible says a good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. Are you leaving a spiritual inheritance? Overshoot it. I don't care how young you are in this room. Overshoot it. Are you leaving an, a spiritual inheritance for your children's children? And that, that needs to go beyond just giving. That needs to go to your, your spiritual legacy. Grandpa, grandma, they knew, he knew, she knew Jesus. She knew Jesus, and the only reason I know Jesus is because they knew Jesus, and they introduced me to them. That comes from only being a cultivated Christian. Y'all getting this today? Cultivated Christian. But here, then he transitions to talking more about seed sowing and parables. And then he said, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven is compared to a man who sowed good seeds in his field. And then while the man was sleeping, weeds were planted. So I want to talk about the kingdom real quick. Three quick points, and then I'm going to let you eat your cupcakes. You good? Number one, the kingdom of God. In the kingdom of God, there are no hybrids. There are no hybrids. If you know anything about hybrid, there, it, that means that you're two things at one time, right? Anybody drive a Prius? Right, that's a hybrid. It's half gas, half electric. And in the kingdom of God, and I know in our society we would just want to be like, well, why can't it be both? In the kingdom of God, there is no both. You are either a wheat or a weed. You got to pick. There are no hybrids. 
You're either wheat or a weed. And at times, in the beginning stages, you might even look the same. Hello. You might even look the same. But where you see the difference, you see the difference during harvest time. You see the difference when life gets a little rocky and the storms come and only the plants with deep roots survive. Weeds, you could pull up a weed easier than you could pull up wheat. And so there are no hybrids in the kingdom. Which one are you? And we're called Fervent Church. And I want us to return back to our identity, our name, for a second. The word fervent means to do it with passion. And in my 20 years of ministry, I've realized this, that I realized that you can't teach anyone to be passionate. You just can't. I can't teach you to be teachable. I can't make you humble. And I can't teach you to desire to change. All of those things are your choice. And today, you can choose, are you wheat or are you weed? Are you wheat or are you weed? And you're like, well, why can't we just be neutral? Why can't we be both? And, and come on, I'm imperfect, and, and I'm not asking you to be a perfect wheat. I'm just asking you to pick a lane. Because the wheat can still struggle the same way weed struggles. And the wheat can still grow the same way weeds grow. But at the end of the day, who are you? during the storm, and who are you during the harvest time? Who are you? And someone's like, why can't it be neutral? Thank God Jesus wasn't neutral. Seriously, thank God Jesus wasn't neutral. Thank God he wasn't like, I'm going to die for you, you, not so much you. Stop smiling, not you. But you, 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 maybe you, we're still waiting on you. The verdict's still out. Thank God he wasn't neutral. He was all in. For he came, so God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That is the gospel that we serve. Our gospel is not neutral. Our gospel is all in. So, we can't be hybrids. We have to pick. And again, this is not about perfection. Even scripture tells us this in, in Revelations chapter 3. It won't be up on the screen, but listen, it talks about this church of Laodicea. And it says this, the words of the amen, the faithful and the true witnesses, the, the beginning of God's creation. And, and this is God talking to that church. And he says this, I know your works and you are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm, because you're neutral, because you're in the middle, because you're trying to be a hybrid, you're neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Let me tell you really quickly about Laodicea. They were surrounded by other towns, and some towns had hot springs, right? You ever been to a hot spring? Come on, where are my old people at with the bad backs? You better try out some hot springs, right? I love me some hot springs. I don't care what anybody says, right? You can put me in the stew any day. And so, so there's some hot springs, and that's therapeutic. They actually thought, back then, they actually thought that it had healing properties in the hot spring. And then there was another town that had cold springs, and they celebrated the cold springs because it was refreshing. But in Laodicea, there was no movement in the water, and it became stale, and it was neither hot nor cold. It was neither hot nor cold. So when, when, when God's telling this church this, he's using basically a parable of what they're surrounded in their environment, and he says, I'd rather you be hot scorching hot, be on passion, be completely passionate and compassionate for the things around you and the people around you for the Lord, or be refreshing. Just walk around being the Joel Osteen of your workplace. Hallelujah. Praise God. I just love Jesus. Like be refreshing and encouraging or be hot and passionate and you're challenging people and you're championing people's growth, but don't be in the middle because there are no hybrids in the kingdom of God. You're either wheat or your weed. And a passionate person, <laughs> a passionate person doesn't see inconvenience. They only see opportunity. And so if we, if we hit rewind for a second, what would it look like in the beginning of 2020 if we were just filled up, if we were a church of more passionate people? What? We can't meet on Sunday? Ain't no thing but a chicken wing. 
We're still, we're still going to meet in my backyard, and we're going to worship God in our backyard. We're going to worship God better in my backyard than we were in a building. Passionate people don't see inconvenience. They see opportunity. And if you want to be that, if you want to live out that, then there can't be any hybrids in the kingdom of God. Number two, worship team's coming up, so I got to hurry up. No, you come up. That's all. Y'all stop. stop. They want their cupcakes too. In the kingdom of God, listen to me, there is no envy, number two. There is no envy. And what I mean by that is I think one thing that's going to help us out is that if you're ever tempted, like myself, to complain and be like, why are the weeds prospering? Why are the weeds growing? If you're scrolling Instagram, Facebook, whatever, you can find yourself in a state of com- c- comparison and you can start envying other people, right? Well, why do they have this and why do they have that? And you can start having this envy inside of us. And, and, and for me, if I'm honest with you, I, I, the Holy Spirit just a few months ago challenged me with something because this is me being honest, and I love being honest up here because I want you to know that I'm human just like you. And I'm scrolling Instagram, and I'm thinking to myself, I'm watching all these other churches, and it feels like they're prospering. And I'm like, man, we should have never closed down the church. And I started thinking that way. But I was like, no, but I know that we... It was important to close down the church, and, and that was just our conviction. And I can't, you can't compare your conviction with somebody else's conviction. You just can't. And so I'm scrolling and scrolling, and, and, and it hit me. And I don't know if this was the Holy Spirit or, or bad pizza the day before, but, but I kind of felt like, stop. This is for you. This is prosperity porn. This is prosperity porn. You're watching everyone prosper, and you're fantasizing about it, and it's not yours. And you don't know the work that was involved to get there. You don't know the pain that they're experiencing while they're there. This is just a fantasy. It's just prosperity porn. Put it down. Because in the kingdom of God, there should be no envy. There shouldn't be. We shouldn't hate someone for prospering. And we we shouldn't compare ourselves to them at all. Because at the end of the day, this is the kingdom of God. So remember I said week one. The kingdom of God should be our reality. Week two, I said the kingdom of God is not natural. Week three, it said the only thing that will last is the kingdom of God. That's the only thing that will last is the kingdom of God. At the end, it all works out. At the end, it all works out. So there should be no envy. And watch yourself, because here's what I know in my life, and maybe it's the same with yours. Envy will always lead you to mistrust God. Because basically what envy is, is like, God, you like them more than you like me. I'll lean into that silence and transition to point three. Number three, and last one, in the kingdom of God, there is no rush. Ooh, I hate that one. I'm impatient. Anybody here impatient? Kingdom of God, there is no rush. But Pastor Mike, there's an urgency, right? The world is dying. Yes, there's an urgency, but the kingdom of God is not rushing. God's not scared of the weeds prospering for a season. He let them grow because, again, at the end of the day, one's going to get stored in the barn and the other one's going to get burned away. Come on. And thank God he's a patient God. Thank God he's a patient God. Let me hit you with this verse, 2 Peter 3, 9. It says this, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that anyone should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Thank God for his patience. Thank God that he continues to to give me grace every single day, because sometimes I've made, has anyone here ever made decade-long mistakes? Year after year after year, and you struggle. And thank God for his patience. Thank God he's not in a rush. One of my boys just the other day, they were going through some stuff. He goes, I just wish Jesus came back just so he could escape this moment. I'm like, no, there's, people still need to hear the word. People still need to get saved. Thank God he's more patient than we are. There is no rush. And here's why that's so important. It's important because some of us, we still live in the American context where it's faster, bigger, stronger, is always better. 
If you're church shopping, if this is your first or second time here at Fervent Church, I get it that you let, let me look for a church that fits all my needs and, and all this other stuff. And sometimes faster, bigger, stronger, faster is better. I get it. But that's American. That's not kingdom. That's an American culture. That's not a kingdom culture. And God's not in a rush. Why? Because he's patient. Why is he patient? Because he's absolutely in love with all of us. And when you deeply love someone, anybody, parents, let me talk to you. Aren't you more patient sometimes with your kids than you are with other kids? I know I am. There are times where like, I'm like hearing, can you shut your kid up? I want to say that. I don't say that, but I want to say, can you shut your kid up? Right? But then with my kids, sometimes I let them go a little bit. Or, and then uh, coming on a bad day, I'm probably more patient with other people's kids than my kids. But for the most part, you, you, when it comes to your children, you always have more patience than anyone else. And I think, thank God, that we serve a father that is patient with us. And he's not in a rush. And he's interested in the process. And he's interested to seeing us get to the place where God wants us to be. And his promise is worth your patience. His promise is worth your patience. And this is what the word of God said. He said, let them grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first, bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barns. Let them grow together. It's fine. I'm in, I'm in, I'm in no rush. There might be some times where your faith is, is in jeopardy because you feel like, oh, the, the craziness in this world feels like it's growing faster than the church. God's not in a rush. God's not worried. So if he's not worried, maybe we shouldn't worry. I'm going to get my cues from Jesus. One of my favorite stories is, is when Jesus was in the boat during the middle of a storm. And this is the audacity. His disciples woke him up. He was taking a nap. He woke him up. He says, Jesus, aren't you worried? Aren't you worried? So when you're worried, our Jesus is resting. When you're worried, Jesus is taking a nap. What would your life look like if you just took your cues? Hallelujah. What is happening? If you took your cues from Jesus. What would your life look like? What would your life look like if we really lived out the kingdom? Amen? Awesome. Let's stand as we smoke this room out. <laughs> I love technology. <laughs> My wife said at, earlier at our volunteers huddle, we get together, we pray before the service. She says, it's okay to have fun. So this is a day of celebration. And so normally I would close up the service and they would play like a slow song and pray over it, but, but um, we're gonna sing that song that we sung from the top, I'm gonna see a victory. And while we're singing that, I, I would love it if you could imagine and envision with me a fervent that is passionate, a fervent that grows together in unity. Imagine yourself this time next year when we celebrate our 10th year. I want you, I want you to imagine, I'm serious about this, I want you to imagine you discipling a few people in your life. You growing this year to the point where you're someone else's go-to person. Oh, not me. My life is a mess. Yeah, join the club. But I believe growth could happen to that capacity in your life if we get down the principles of the kingdom. Amen? Amen. Let me pray for you. Father, we thank you for today, we celebrate what you have done, what you're doing, and what you're gonna do. You are king. So have your reign in this moment. Be our authority as we sing. Be our authority as we go out throughout our day. Be our authority on Monday morning. And let that authority grow in our lives so that we could grow and we could see the kingdom of God more and more lived out through your church, through fervent church, and in agreement with everything that we have, we say yes and amen to you. In Jesus' name, amen.